Hi, I'm Andrew Dubber. I'm the director of Music Tech Fest, and this is the MTF podcast. As you know, MTF's seen its fair share of hackathons, hacking, and hackers over the past eight years. We don't tend to use the term quite so much these days. There's just so much baggage associated with it. On the one hand, there are some people for whom the term is synonymous with online crime, cybersecurity breaches, and the illegal tapping of phones by tabloid newspapers. And on the other, there are the corporate events where young people with tech skills and great ideas are assembled in order to have their intellectual property harvested in exchange for a pizza and energy drinks fueled sleepover. These days, for clarity, we run what we call labs, but that doesn't mean that hacking has ceased to be interesting for us. The willingness to take something apart and put it back together in a new way, to repurpose, work around, use an item not according to its manufacturer's instructions, code for justice, make to solve problems, invent to address challenges, and hack the system, whatever the system happens to be. But the public and critical discourse of hacking is something quite different, even though, to be fair, there's probably still a little bit of overlap. But at the heart of all of that hacker discourse, the spectre of Anonymous looms large. The V-Mask, Guy Fawkes, the coordinated campaigns of political activism, online attacks on extremist groups, mass trolling, effective and for its targets often terrifyingly swift and devastating swarm behaviour. And there's one person who has made a career understanding Anonymous. Gabriella Coleman is an anthropologist, academic and author whose work focuses on hacker culture and online activism, particularly anonymous. She holds the Wolf Chair in Scientific and Technological Literacy at McGill University in Montreal. She's been called the world's foremost scholar on anonymous and her 2014 book, Hacker, Hoaxer, Whistleblower, Spy, The Many Faces of Anonymous is pretty much the defining work on the topic though she's also the author of Coding Freedom, The Ethics and Aesthetics of Hacking, and the editor of The Participatory Condition in the Digital Age. From her home in Canada, this is Hackademic, Dr. Gabriella Coleman. Enjoy. Gabriella Coleman, thanks so much for joining us for the MTF podcast today. It's my pleasure to be here. You are the Wolf Chair in Scientific and Technological Literacy at McGill University. I have two questions about that. First one, Wolf? Uh, Wolf is the name of the donor. It's not the our wolf. (laughs) Okay. It's got an E on the end. Yeah. I sometimes think of that wolf. Uh So that's where the name comes from. And the other one is literacy. What is meant by literacy in scientific and technological literacy? Right. So, um, you know, the donor is someone who is a doctor. But he also spent a couple of years doing a lot of work in humanities and social sciences, and he felt like that was very complimentary. He funded a number of chairs, some in the sciences, but he just felt like questions of science and technology, you know, are quite complicated. And it's important for academics who work in this area to also, you know, reach out to the public and teach them about the kind of ethics and politics of science and technology so we're you know more aware and we can make better choices and and so on and so mm. forth so uh, that's where the name came from right because when i see literacy i'm always reminded uh, somebody said to me once when you see literacy it's not just the ability to read it's also the ability to write that's right that's right and it's uh, you know i i guess i'm not um you know my position isn't one that necessarily provides technical literacy in that way mm-hmm. um but nevertheless you know um, I mean, it's a two way street, though, as well, because I think part of doing tech literacy is also to work with a technologist. Right. And uh, at McGill, I'm lucky enough where I get to teach science and engineering students as well. And so they do actually have one type of tech literacy, but maybe not the other side of tech literacy. Sure. And you're kind of known for being the expert in anonymous and, and hacking in general. Um, let's start with what's a hacker and what's a hack? What's a hacker? <laughs> hacker is a very rich and contested term. Um, I mean, historically, the term came from MIT and the Tech Model Railroad Club. It was kind of used by the engineers who were playing with a train system. Um, 
to make it work better. And the solution that they came up with was often clever and non-obvious. And so in some ways, the kernel of the definition is someone who often works with technology, though hacking doesn't necessarily only have to go with technology, who's kind of curious about systems, wants to understand them, and wants to improve them, and is often um, willing to use non-traditional avenues to solve and improve technology. But that's a, a sort of core definition. Um, and then when you look at the practice of hacking sociologically, um, you know, it pertains to many different technical communities from people who write free and open source software. They believe that the underlying directions to software should be made available to hackers who break into systems, sometimes for fun, um, but also to improve them, to those that write cryptography, right? So they're very, very different types of technical communities who have their own histories and their own ethics. And many of themselves, many of them call themselves hackers as well. Mm. Is it sort of by definition transgressive? I mean, getting things to do things that they weren't necessarily designed for? I think because you're willing to either disobey tradition, norms, or laws. Yes, inherently it's transgressive, but it's on a spectrum where certain hackers are unwilling to break the law, but they're certainly willing to break norms, traditions, and rules. And then there's other hackers who are very much willing to go even further and break the law as well, sometimes in pursuit of justice and sometimes just in pursuit of technical knowledge. Or self-entertainment. Or self-entertainment, exactly. Yeah. Or sometimes for all of them at right. once. <laughs> sure. You've used the word trickster in a lot of your writing. Um, can you sort of unpack that a little bit? What do you mean by the term and, and sort of what's the baggage that comes along with that? Uh, yeah, the second part's important because there is a lot of baggage that comes with it. So a trickster figure is probably familiar to, to most just because trickster figures um, are common in many different societies and cultures around the world from coyote and, and kind of indigenous Native American societies um, to Loki and Nordic societies, right? Mm -hmm. And they're, they're figures who are willing to transgress boundaries. Um, they tend to also be identified with an inability to kind of filter speech, they're often willing to trap others and in the process get trap themselves into problems. And historically, they, they, they tend to be identified with myth and stories. And the myth and stories around tricksters are valuable because they tend to offer moral lessons, both about the importance of transgressing boundaries, but also the problems when you go too far in transgressing boundaries as well. Um, they're a rich area of anthropological study. And I thought, and I still do, think that they apply extremely well to the field of hacking or anonymous. And it's, again, because of the willingness of hackers to transgress boundaries. And so I think that that model fits well. Uh, I think one of the big problems, and this gets to the baggage part, is that in part because of like the Disneyfication of the trickster figure, I think some people believe tricksters are always good. And that's not necessarily the case. I mean, the point of the trickster is to make clear the moral stakes of transgressing boundaries, let's just say. Hmm. And then because of that clarity, you could say, oh, this is good. This is helpful. No, this is bad. This goes too far. And for example, Loki, I think, is a, a good example of a, a trickster who, I mean, he's terrifying and he's a jerk and he's horrible right mm -hmm. this is not necessarily someone to celebrate whereas puck on the other side right um is a much lighter um side of, of tricksterism that we can live with right. right much more fluffy exactly and the world of hacking has 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 both sides right right and so i use the figure not simply to celebrate hacking but actually to show that this domain, like the trickster figure, provides an arena for us to rethink questions of boundaries and norms. 
not simply to blindly accept everything that comes from the world of hacking. But I, I don't think I always explain that as clearly uh, as I do now. Um, and that was in part, you know, when you write something, there's reactions to it and then you go, oh, okay, I should have done this maybe slightly differently. Sure, sure. And these sort of uh, ancient morality stories, do the tricksters tend to win or is that more complex too? It is more complex. I mean, they do win sometimes, um, but precisely because they sometimes lack impulse control, they get trapped in their own traps, right? And this is, again, what's so nice about applying that to the hacker world. Like if you look at anonymous, um, you know, the hackers who were willing to break the law, um, you know, some got away with it and others didn't get away with it. And sometimes, I mean, what's, what's funny and ironic about them is that many of the hackers knew a lot about security, uh, but sometimes they just couldn't help themselves when they were involved in a hack and were too quick and, and didn't think they were going to get caught, right? And they did. <laughs> um, and so, again, um, both whether it's the trickster, the hackster, or the hackster, the, the hacker, they <laughs> sometimes win, but, but sometimes, you know, um, it's a very impulsive experimental mode, sometimes tricksterism, and you fall into your own trap at times. Hmm. We seem to be talking about anonymous in the past tense. Is that deliberate? I mean, I think, I mean, they're still around and there was a little bit of a resurgence in recent times, in part because they uh, collaborated and interfaced with the Korean pop fan Twitter scene, which was super interesting. Sure. Um, but the kind of apex and height of their activity certainly occurred in the past, I would say. Right. And they were so prolific, especially the hackers, um, that the standard that was set up, uh, especially in 2011 and 12, was such that activity today seems minuscule in comparison to that period. Right. What did or does Anonymous want? Because we already seem to be pretty good for chaos. Anonymous is a multi-use name. Mm -hmm. So that's a good place to start with trying to understand with what they want. A multi-use name means that it's a little bit like open source. Anyone can take the name and use it and run with it and do what they want with it and make certain claims under it. Um, between 2010 and 15, especially, there were you know, consistent patterns around how the name was used in part because of how it was used in 2011 by certain activists who got involved in um, the social movements of 2011. They tended to get involved with uh, causes on the kind of liberal left spectrum. Um, but they got involved in hundreds and hundreds of different causes all around the world, right? From fighting rape culture in the United States to fighting censorship in India. So Anonymous doesn't want anything universally. And you have to almost measure what they want, and what they do by operation. And again, even though there's some consistency in terms of like their style and what they tended to support. Because it was a multi-use name, there was a lot of variability around who, when, why, where. And that's, that's still the case today as well. Politically speaking, I mean, you, you said liberal left, but is there a kind of a libertarian streak through this? Uh, you know, I don't see it as much with anonymous. Certainly within other quarters of the hacker world, it's very, very strong. But let's say randist. Okay, Randis. Yeah, definitely not. Um, I mean, weirdly enough, Anonymous tended to get involved in 2011 and 12 with a lot of social justice issues. They were critical of, of government when there was an overreach of surveillance, right, and, and criticality around the government in that way. But if you looked at a lot of the people who were involved, you know, they were pro-universal health care. Sure right? Or free education, the sort of things that are a kind of randist libertarian wouldn't be. Yeah, for sure. So, so in that way, I wouldn't tag them that way. And, but it's a, it's a good and important question because I think actually the, the world of hacking has been over identified with libertarianism. And we can talk about why that is, and it certainly exists. Uh, but I think that over identification is not rooted kind of in reality, especially when you take into account Europe where you are, 
which is probably one of the most interesting places for the history of hacking. In what way? Um, the Chaos Computer Club, which is a really important hacker organization founded in the 1980s, mm -hmm. um, has huge membership in Germany and attracts a huge number of people during their conferences, um, which happen once a year for the Congress and every four years for the camp is probably one of the most important hacker organizations that always put that put politics front and center to their work and identity. Yet, even though they're so important, we know a lot less about them. There's not major histories written about them. And instead, like the American version gets told. And parts of the American version are far more libertarian than the European one, right? Sure. Now, what they all share is a commitment to civil liberties, fighting for privacy, ensuring um, that the government doesn't censor organizations and journalists, right? Whistleblowing. There's a kind of like baseline of civil liberties that a lot of hackers share that then gets over-identified with libertarianism. But yeah, if you ask most German hackers like, hey, should we get rid of like um, affordable or free public education and healthcare? Many of them would be like, heck no, right? right? Yeah. I think that's important to, to keep on the table, you know, and keep in view. For sure. There, there are some terms that it's probably good to unpack a little bit. And, and I, I don't want you to sort of give a, a definition of anything, but of these things, what do we need to know about? Uh, 4chan, LulzSec, AntiSec, Cabin Crew, you know, it, it does get kind of deep and complex. What do we need to know? Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. So those terms pertain back to the world of anonymous. I mean, I think 4chan is important to know and understand what it is. 4chan is an image board, uh, anonymous image board, infamous in many ways. What do you mean by image board? So an image board is like an old school message board, except you have to start a thread with an image. And the image boards also became famous like 4chan because they were one of the places that generated many internet memes, such as internet memes around cats. And that's in part because of the fact that they were trafficking in images, right? Mm -hmm. So certainly they're not the only place that generated meme culture, but one of the most important places. And so 4chan is a board where people post anonymously and if you go to the board, the username for each person is anonymous, 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 anonymous. The kind of collective identity name anonymous came from that image board, but it was used first for trolling and pranking. And, you know, trolling and pranking, a little bit like tricksterism, can be on a spectrum from lighthearted and funny to freaking terrifying. Sure. And then at a certain point due to you know, a lot of contingencies and other events, the name broke away from trolling and started to be used for um, activism. And over time, Anonymous was less and less involved in board culture as well. So its origins are there, um, but it kind of grew apart and then different types of actors and political cultures grew on 4chan and 8chan. And in specific post 2014, especially, um, members of the far right, alt right were really present on those boards, uh, became people on the boards became involved in recruitment campaigns to try to red pill people, which is a kind of term to, to convert them to their kind of ideology. This is a matrix reference. It's a matrix reference, exactly, to see, you know, the truth, right? right? When you take the red pill, you see what's true. And in the context of the far right and the alt right, it's to see that things like feminism and multiculturalism are really forms of authoritarianism and totalitarianism. Uh -huh. That's their belief, right? Um, so a very different political culture has grown, you know, at different moments, different political cultures have grown from these image boards. So what's the role of IRC as a technology in all this? Because that seems to be, I mean, it's something that I used, I don't know, 25 years ago. I didn't know that anybody still used it, but it seems to be important. <laughs> oh, it's so important. I feel like you can't understand anything about the hacker world 
whether tree software or anonymous without looking at internet relay chat, you know, which is still used, but now new platforms like Slack and discord, um, are what a younger generation are, are tending to use. Similar thing though, right? Very similar. It's basically a place where there's different rooms. People come, you know, log into the rooms and chat. The difference with Slack and Discord is that there's a lot more bells and whistles on Slack and Discord, right? You could share emoticons and images and Discord, you have voice chat. I find it a little overwhelming. <laughs> But, but they're important because they provide a sense of place, like going to a cafe, you know? Um, if you visit a certain IRC chat room enough, you feel like you're going somewhere and you get to really know the people. And it's really good for conversations and organizing things, right? right? right. What, 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 um, what were you on IRC for? Exactly that. I mean, this is like, I guess, 95 to 2000. Okay. It was about who else is on this thing. Yeah. And, and those conversations sort of building from there. And they were very much about interests. Uh, right. Talk, I think I talked about music a lot, frankly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So IRC is where the kind of the organization of Anonymous takes place or took place? Took place. Yeah, exactly. Um, so between, yeah, 2010 onwards, certain IRC servers were incredibly popular. One was called AnonOps. They had multiple rooms. Some were, were general rooms, like for reporters, or one called Lounge, where you could kick back and talk about fun stuff. And others were for operations, Op Tunisia, Op Occupy, and that's where people would come together and you know strategize and talk. And, and many of the rooms were public. And then the hackers were in private rooms um, because they were, you know, organizing illegal activity. So it wasn't like everyone could just be there. Hmm. Tell me about the masks, the, the Guy Fawkes thing. Is this sort of life imitating art? Uh, v for Vendetta is the sort of the, the ground zero for this? Or yeah, what was the meaning of the mask? It's such a great story. I've learned a lot about the mask. <laughs> okay, so first of all, you know, Anonymous is almost synonymous today with Guy Fox mask. Yeah. But what's fascinating is that they actually took on the mask somewhat accidentally or was due to a contingency. Mm -hmm. So one of the first truly earnest operations was against the Church of Scientology. Right. Anonymous decided to organize street protests. And just briefly, why? So uh, there was a video that was released to the internet of Tom Cruise. And it was an internal recruitment video for the Church of Scientology. Uh, did you, have you ever seen that video? I haven't. I haven't sorted it out. I've none of its existence. Yeah, yeah. You, you have to watch it. It's really funny. It's just this like incredible video of Tom Cruise, like basically saying, if you're not a Scientologist, you're worthless. You know, and only Scientologists can help other people. And so it was... Uh, leaked to the internet by former Scientologists. Right. And then Gawker and other publications published it. And then Scientology threatened to sue these publishers if they didn't take it down. And Anonymous at the time, which was a trolling shop, decided to troll the Church of Scientology. And they did so over days, sending pizzas to churches and prank calling them. And then former Scientologists who were critical of the church reached out to Anonymous and was like, hey, what you're doing is great, but why don't you do this like earnestly? Like, don't do it just for fun. Hmm. And there was a big debate within these chat rooms and then they decided, okay, let's try this, you know? Um, and in part, I think they just decided to do the street protest because people from 4chan wanted to meet each other because it's anonymous, right? Sure. But when they decided to protest in front of churches from Melbourne to London to Montreal, one of the points of discussion was like, oh, wow, Scientology takes high definition photos of, of critics. Mm -hmm. And so we don't want to be targeted. What do we do? Let's mask ourselves. Yep. And then someone suggested the Guy Fox mask because it was easily available on the internet and Halloween stores. Right. And so on February 10th, 2008, about 9,000 people show up around the world in front of Scientology churches in about 127 cities and they're all wearing the mask you know so all of a sudden because of this need to self-protect 
this name anonymous becomes identified with this symbol, right? And it looks like it's life imitating art. Yeah. But it's a it's a it's a it's a longer cycle because the art, the guy um, V for Vendetta, the movie or the graphic novel, um, is really imitating life since Guy Fox was a historical figure, right? And he was fi- fictionalized starting in the 1850s, actually. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And what's so interesting about that is the figure of Guy Fox was kind of a terrorist figure in England. I mean, he was like really frowned upon, but because of children's books and novels in the 1850s, mm. he started to be cast as a hero, anti-hero. And then that transformation fully happens with V for Vendetta, the graphic novel and movie. Yeah. And then when people start to take on the mask, it fully takes on a new set of associations. Yeah, that's interesting. And it's interesting how, in a different way, masks have become more sort of political and and potent within protests as well as sort of the COVID thing. Um, but but in a very different way, covering the face seems to be like an important thing to do in any political agitation setting. That's right. You know, if you look at Hong Kong, for example, um, a lot of face coverings there, both with Guy Fox masks and other coverings uh, to protect themselves against you know, the Chinese state. We've seen in many parts of the world, but especially the United States with Black Lives Matter protests, people were wearing the mask to protect themselves against the virus, but also from surveillance. And I feel like it's become a little bit more accepted in recent times because of these big protests, because the mask is a a very ambivalent figure, both the Guy Fawkes mask and masking in general, right? Uh, Like the trickster as well. It's not like straightforward. Mm -hmm. Some people are very scared by masks. Well, aren't you a bad actor if you're masking yourself? Can't you show who you are? You know, you're only uh, morally good if if you come attached with a true identity, right? Right. Because otherwise, you know, if you don't have anything to hide. Exactly. I guess that's... Exactly. And it's, it's still, you know... I think anonymity is a very complex phenomenon, and it isn't always good. Um, but whether it's, yeah, anonymous or increased masking or increased surveillance, some people are starting to see the value and importance of being able to be anonymous in different ways online or in the streets. Hmm. I've got a few questions about the relationship between anonymous and other things. Uh, <laughs> one of them is WikiLeaks. One of them is QAnon. Okay. You know, is, is there a connection there or is that just, uh, you know, um, you know, just happen to have some of the same letters in the name, um, <laughs> and and also the 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 relationship between the kind of the hackers that you talk about, and what goes on in these sort of corporate hackathons. Uh, you know, are, are those things related in, in in any particular way? But let's start with WikiLeaks because I'm kind of interested in that story and how that kind of unpacks. Yeah. So again, historically, there was a very tight relation between anonymous and WikiLeaks, insofar as. Well, first of all, they're very different. Mm -hmm. You know, WikiLeaks was an organization. You knew who was involved, Julian Assange. Uh, There was a kind of cult of personality around WikiLeaks, right? Sure. Anonymous, on the other hand, was kind of like a horde, a mass. Anyone could join. There was not only no cult of personality, they were anti-cult of personality. That was their core ethic. But they were related insofar as it was just a period where lots of geeks and hackers were taking on the political sword and in different ways and believed in protests and information freedom. And at a certain point when WikiLeaks published all the diplomatic cables that Chelsea Manning provided, uh, the American diplomatic cables, which basically showed a lot of America's dirty laundry to the world, Mm -hmm. right? The U.S. government got really, really upset and asked uh, MasterCard and Visa and other financial services and Amazon to pull the plug and not provide services for um, WikiLeaks anymore. Hmm. And this was the moment that then Anonymous engaged in a protest against that form of preemptive action, you know, that the, the government took. And then all of a sudden, the two became associated at that moment, right? Hmm. But then over time, um, you know, Julian Assange and WikiLeaks became more and more controversial for various reasons. Yep. Lost a little bit of its shine. <laughs> yeah. You know, they, they weren't always so good at, at protecting people's privacy when leaking. 
Julian Assange had flirtations with the alt-right. Um, and I would say like a lot of people anonymous were quite critical, right? And disappointed in that. Um, and certainly I think some former members of anonymous and current members do feel like Julian Assange is facing an unfair trial, you know, for espionage in the United States. They're trying to extradite him and they're very concerned about that. All the while knowing that WikiLeaks as an organization and as a leaking platform had a lot of problems as well. Let's talk about QAnon because that, that one, I, I feel like I don't understand anything. Yeah. I mean, QAnon also emerged from the boards. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's that relationship. But many things have emerged from the boards, right? So just because something kind of was cultivated on anonymous image boards, I think in some people's minds makes them similar okay. because the origin point is similar. But actually, I do find QAnon almost polar opposite of anonymous. Right. Aside from the anonymity, a lot of people involved are anonymous, although some of the figures in QAnon are very public and well-known, right? Sure. Um, so they don't have the same like really hardcore ethic to anonymity. And also like anonymous, even though there were masks and there was lots of mysteries, in some ways they followed very classical liberal scripts around truth. Like they wanted to work with journalists to tell the truth. They wanted to stamp out conspiracy theories. That's why they hated Scientology. They saw Scientology as this religion of conspiracy and and false ideas. Mm -hmm. And that's how many people anonymous see QAnon. Right. QAnon are the Scientologists of the story now. Exactly. Exactly. Right. And, the, and, and Anonymous has kind of gone after them a little bit and made fun of them, right? And actually, QAnon doesn't use the symbols, the Guy Fox mask mm-hmm. um, or the headless suit man. And, and a lot of the accounts will have American flags, right? Yeah. Um, so by name and origin, similar, but in terms of focus and worldview, um, you know, so different. Right. Okay. Hackathons. Hackathons. Yeah. I mean, I think what you point to there is something that I, you know, I raised earlier is that there's like very different communities of practice around hacking yep. where you can have anything from groups like Wellstech, which were affiliated with anonymous, like break into companies and governments for 50 days in a row, like hack into these places. I mean, talk about hardcore and risky to then like feel good hackathons, um, which also, if you look at all hackathons, some are very different. Some are very politically oriented or at least oriented towards like civic issues, like let's improve government. And then other hackathons are like in the service of corporate capitalism, like a McDonald's hackathon, right? And so they, they take on very, very different forms, especially based on where it's happening. So Silicon Valley hackathons, many of them are very kind of naive and in, in, in the service of corporate goals. And they're very, very different from like, you know, a grassroots hackathon, yeah. which might be oriented towards improving a privacy tool, right? And so there you just have to kind of look at the hackathon and it's just a good reminder that hackers organize themselves in rather different ways from hardcore illegal to kind of feel good all day events, um, some of which are very naive and, and others which, you know, are a little bit more pragmatic and a little less naive. Sure. One thing I'm really kind of interested in, it seems like, uh, and you can kind of correct or clarify this, but it seems like politicians and political operatives have basically picked up these kind of trickster tools and methods in terms of information and disinformation on social media and those sorts of things. Is is that the derivation of what we're seeing now in terms of political discourse? Yes. <laughs> That's a short answer. I'll give you one specific example. Sure. Because there's so many things going on, but one that really concretizes what you've just raised. So one of the fascinating things and one of the legacies of Anonymous is that the hacker groups broke into companies, took emails, and published them online. Now, you would think that that has been around forever as a mode of kind of whistleblowing or release of information. 
it's very new, actually. Like hackers were certainly prior to the era of anonymous breaking into things. It would often take source code, software, even email as kind of trophies to share with each other or embarrass a group, mm -hmm. but they weren't using it as a mode of, I'm going to release it to the world in the hopes that journalists and the public will mine that information. Anonymous completely were responsible for taking what's existed here and there, packaging it into a format that you could emulate. And other hacktivists started to do it. Phineas Fisher is probably the most famous one. Mm -hmm. People should look up Phineas Fisher, but then governments started to do it as well. Yeah. And that's what's so fascinating is the governments were also hacking each other with impunity, but they were doing it so quietly. And in part, I think because of the very visibility of hacking and leaking, certain governments and their hacker groups started to do the same. North Korea. These, these are state-operated hacker groups. Exactly, exactly. And they, they have different formats. Sometimes they're like literally in a government office. And other times it's, it's more like privateers, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, Guardians of Peace from North Korea hacked into Sony, took their emails and published them. And whether or not they literally were like, oh, Anonymous inspired us, or it was just in the atmosphere now. I think it was more it was just in the atmosphere. Sure. We could see how hacktivists put forward certain tactics, and then nation states also follow in their footsteps in order to engage in disinformation campaigns or confusion. Right. Okay, so on that, tell me about Stuxnet. Uh, well, I actually don't know a whole lot about it, so I'm a little bit reluctant uh, to say much about it. Right. But I'll say a little bit about it and then recommend Kim Zetter's book, which covers it in detail. Further reading, always welcome. Exactly, exactly. But it is interesting insofar as um, it is considered to be like a cyber weapon, I guess, is the term. Okay. Sometimes that term is applied to things that really are not cyber weapons, but this, I think, probably fits. And so the Israelis and the American government collaborated to kind of create a piece of malware that would infect a piece of equipment that was um, in Iran and connected to their nuclear reactors in order to disable them. And um, very technically clever and fascinating, right? And it gives a taste of what you can do with technology today, given that critical infrastructure of various kinds are interconnected. I mean, in this case, it wasn't connected to the internet, right? So mm -hmm. the malware, I think, had to be transported, if I remember correctly, through a USB stick, okay. right? Like Will Smith and in, uh, Independence Day, that exactly, sort of thing. Exactly, exactly. But the point being that, you know, since computers are attached to everything, Mm. Right. From your, you know, pacemaker to a nuclear reactor with the right software or malware or intervention, you could cause a lot of damage sure. on these systems. And I think Stuxnet really um, is a great example of that possibility. On that basis, are you worried about things like driverless vehicles, IoT devices, smart homes? Very much. Yeah. I think that they're a bad idea on in at many different levels from, you know, if your car is all software, do you have the right to repair it? Do you own certain things or is, you know, the car company just going to be leasing parts of your car to you and you need to upgrade it, right? To the fact that, you know, the more software there is, the more hackable things are. Even though security has has improved a lot in many different domains. I mean, when everything is run on software, even when you have very, very good security, the nature of software in these systems make it such that there is always the potential for kind of hacking. Mm. And so while again, they, they might offer a lot of features and possibilities, you know, I personally tend to like products and things with less software, or if it's run with software, you would still hope that things could run without the software as well. You know, driverless cars, I don't think are going to happen, actually. 
<laughs> on what basis? I mean, there's, you know, I think people who really follow this have smarter things to say. But while a lot of technical hurdles have been um, overcome, uh, a lot of people say that it's just too complex of a problem to really um, get to the point where you just have autonomous vehicles driving everywhere. Right. I mean, think about the sensors in bathrooms. You know, they barely work, right? And I'm sure the technologies in cars are better. Sure. Um, but I think it's just going to be too glitchy. Yeah. Um, outside of uh, like maybe some cases, like truck driving on highways, right? Mm -hmm. That may work. Sure. Um, having everyone um, use autonomous vehicles is probably not that realistic. But yeah, bringing up hand dryers uh, actually makes it quite a scary proposition. I know. I mean, and that's the thing. I hate bathrooms where like everything's on a sensor and you just have a horrible experience from the beginning to the end, right? Yep. Your toilet like flushes when you're sitting on it. <laughs> the water thing, it doesn't turn on, yeah. right? Which, which doesn't result in multiple deaths, I guess. At least, no. that, you know, there's that. <laughs> but uh, Exactly. Uh, should, we, should we resign ourselves to the idea that secrets are basically unprotectable now? It's much harder. It's much, much harder. But I think it's possible. You know, I think... Um, there's always going to be an ability to hold secrets because in part that's a sociological issue, not simply a technical one, right? But there is always a possibility for more leaking as well today, right? Sure. But, you know, you, you can imagine those who want to hold secrets will change practices. So I'll give one example. I mean, email um, has produced a lot of interesting information whether it's like Enron, the energy company, like their emails provided a lot of information about corruption to the emails that WikiLeaks has published. You know, I think it'll happen slowly, but I think people are more aware of the danger of having emails leaked. So guess what? They'll stop writing that information on email. And yeah. anything sensitive will be face-to-face, -face, phone. So I think there'll, there'll be a reconfiguration of this stuff. But, but certainly we do live in an, in an era where Seussvalence, the ability to watch the watchers or leak information um, is more common than ever before. Right. So is that your recommendation of how we should now live is just on the understanding that you're basically being tracked? Right now, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a little depressing. But on the other hand, then it gives you an ability to be like, do I want to put that information online? Maybe I don't. Mm. And that's okay, right? Sure. So it's it's not necessarily a state where you're really, really being watched. You just have to be mindful of anything that is, um, you know, put somewhere tangible can eventually be made public. Right. Here's the thing I'm curious about. Why you? What, what is it about this that draws you to it? Why are you the world expert on Anonymous? Where did that start from? Oh, man. It started with my interest in hackers because I was trained as a very traditional anthropologist. I was working in Guyana, South America on religious healing. And two things happened. One thing was that I learned about the copyleft license, which are the class of licenses that free software developers use to free their information. And I, I was just floored. I was like, wait a minute. A bunch of nerds and engineers and technical people made a legal mechanism to accomplish what they wanted to accomplish politically. And at the time, I was following um, some legal battles over patents and HIV drugs in the global south, um, where these drugs were too expensive and people were breaking the patents. And I was like, wow, this is cool. This is like a different way to treat you know, music and drugs sure. and information. We don't need to use copyrights and patents. I was just blown away, you know? It really was mind-blowing to me. So I just started to follow it and write papers on it. But I was not going to study hackers because that's not what an anthropologist did, right? <laughs> Especially for their first project. But guess what? I mean, it, I'm saying this because it relates to the moment. I got really sick for a year and I was at home. I had Lyme disease and I didn't know I had Lyme disease. Hmm. And so since I was stuck at home, I couldn't take classes. I spent all my time on the internet 
and I was learning more and more about free and open source software. And by the time I got better, first of all, I was just too hooked. Second, I was like, no, this matters culturally, ethically, politically, you know? Yep. And even though I had lost a year since I'd done so much research, if I move forward with it, I wouldn't have lost, I, I didn't lose the year, right? Sure. And so all those things kind of came together and I convinced my advisor that I should switch to hackers. Is there any intersection whatsoever with religious healers going on here or have you just <laughs> walked away from one subject to another? Well, that's what I think I, I enjoyed about the anonymous project at first was when they went after the Church of Scientology. I was a religious studies major and I was interested in, you know, issues around secularism and tolerance and religion. And some of those issues came back with that. And also, I mean, funny enough, I mean, hackers are really into, you know, you don't find a lot of religious hackers. There are exceptions, but they tend to be atheists, you know, skeptics. Uh, and yet at another level, um, they're very monastic, obsessive. There's a certain type of uh, religious fervor you know, that you see in this world as well. Yeah. Um, and rich and very ritualistic, extremely ritualistic. So what I loved about it was that, and this is something that anthropologists know well, that even in so-called secular society, you have motifs of enchantment and ritual and a kind of religious experience that still lives. Mm -hmm. And and that is completely true with the hacker domain as well. So I think my background in religion kind of helped me see those characteristics, right, that I maybe wouldn't see otherwise. So you can unpack the iconography and those sorts of things. Exactly, exactly. Right. Have you embraced the term hackademic or is that just uh, <laughs> something we should brush under the carpet? No, you know, I, um, I do have a mailing list called Hackademia, which brings together some academics who work on hackers. Um, and I think that's helpful because people tend to be in very different fields and I, I do think there's a kind of skepticism sometimes when you work on hackers too. It's like, well, aren't there just a bunch of white males and shouldn't you just point your finger at like how bad that is? And I'm like, well, no, you know, first of all, it's more interesting, more complicated than that. Mm -hmm. um, and there are politics around diversity and inclusion in the last 10 years actually is sometimes more progressive than academic institutions. It's, you know what I mean? Um, so I kind of wanted to create a space where people working on hackers could share information and exchange information and, and get support. But I don't call myself a academic. So All right. Maybe I okay. should. <laughs> All right. For, for further reading, give me one thing by you, one thing by somebody else that we should check out. Sure. Okay. Hacker, Hoaxer, Whistleblower, Spy is a fun book. So maybe check that out. And it's on um, the internet. Uh huh. That's your one. And actually, the second thing I'm going to mention is a very hackery thing that I, I help curate and edit, but the great majority of the authors are not me. But check out Hack Curio. If you go to my website, GabriellaColeman.org, you'll find a link to it. And it's a hacker cabinet of video curiosities. It's kind of like an exhibit where. Um, We've compiled a lot of videos, short videos from the hacker world, and each video is under a category, like privacy, free software, blockchain, hacktivism. And each video comes with a short entry about the video. Hmm. And the point there both is to use hacker methodologies like collaboration and also to showcase the kind of diversity and variability of the hacker world in visual form, because it's so hard to represent hacking mm. sometimes visually. Um, and people have a lot of stereotypes about what it is. So this is a kind of resource where you can spend time looking at videos and, and learn a little bit about hacking. And there's just, we, we have over 50 entries and probably about 40 authors right now. Right. Wow. Um, journalists, academics, and hackers who've, who've written for the website. Fantastic. There have been some really interesting representations of hackers in cinema. What's your favorite? Okay, my favorite is Who Am I? No System is Safe. Mm -hmm. And it's a German film released by Sony. And I think it represents hacking 
both at a meta level, very accurately. I can't tell you what I mean because then I would spoil the plot. Okay. But the other thing I love about it is that it's got all these cool actual references, historical references to hacking uh, from references to the Chaos Computer Club, to Kevin Poulsen, to Lulsec. Mm -hmm. And then the other two things that I love about it is that it represents chatting in a way that is just brilliant. It has a trickster motif in the movie. And finally, instead of featuring a single hacker, it has four types of hackers, which I love. The programmer, the social engineer, the hardware hacker, and the security vulnerability person. Because hacking actually entails different communities of practice right. and different types of technical interventions. And it's one of the first movies that really kind of represents that. So everything about it, I think, is great. Go watch it. Who am I? No system is safe. Fantastic. Gabriella, it's been really fascinating. Thanks so much for your time. Oh, my pleasure. That's Gabriella Coleman, and that's the MTF podcast. You can find Gabriella online at gabriellacoleman.org. Her Twitter account is at Biella Coleman. I'm Andrew Dubber. You can find me at Dubber on Twitter. Music Tech Fest is at Music Tech Fest pretty much everywhere. This week's episode was edited by Jake Dubber with music by Moon and Airtone. And the MTF audio logo, as always, was created by Run Dreamer. Don't forget to share, like, rate and review because it really helps other people find the show and because we'd really appreciate it and love to hear your thoughts. You have a great week. Stay safe and we'll talk soon. Cheers. (laughs) 